excited to have you here, Ricardo, today. Thank you so much. Um, it's just, it was, we, we met, um, so a short um, story, but I met Ricardo um, at one of our BNI meetings in Miami, and um, we really got into some in-depth conversations about title and real estate. And um, you're just, you know, you're just sharp and know your mm -hmm. stuff. And so I'm really excited to be able to have you here today. Um, so I really appreciate your time. Uh, are you are your business development at Folio Title? Is that your title? Yeah. So I basically started Folio with uh, with an attorney partner. So I'm co-founder of Folio. And I basically call myself business development director, which basically means do anything that the business needs to grow. <laughs> um, right. You know, we have been very fortunate because we have a lot of technology that we try to develop in-house to create a better customer experience and really differentiate ourselves from the thousands of title agents that are out there, right? Um, I think that title is such a key partnership, especially for real estate agents, but not every title company loves working with real estate agents. And, you know, not every company is really structured to to put themselves in the real estate agent's shoes on what they need to guide their clients. You know, if you recommend a title company and the title company does a mediocre job, who cares? If the title company does a crappy job, you may lose a client, right? Because you recommended them. So, you know, our objective is pretty simple. How, how do we help real estate agents gain financial freedom by being extraordinary and getting their clients to keep recommending them clients? So it's it's not rocket science. Now, behind the curtain, there, there we do believe there is a lot of science. Um, there, are, there are different ways that you can skin a cat. And um, we think in a real estate transaction, because every single transaction is different, um, it's extremely difficult to know what to expect on each one. So every every transaction is like, you know, full of surprises. So we've developed a couple of methodologies that we feel help us anticipate issues better while ensuring a great customer experience. Um, you know, we call it context-based processing where, where essentially we have about 12 to 15 different factors that can impact the way that a transaction needs to go, depending on what's in the contract, what kind of a property it is, what kind of buyers and sellers there are, um, the type of financing. And, and, and you know, that, that will dictate these different workflows, right? So in Miami, it turns out that it's basically one of the cities and municipalities with the highest level of complexity of any closing in the United States because so many of these contexts come into play. So for example, you know, we have a we have 25 people on our staff, one of our title managers, she's run title companies in four different states. And you know, we've gone through many of her closings and they're much much simpler. Right? There's things that happen in the South Florida market that create a lot of complexity. And so if you're a title company and you want to approach every file the same, you're setting yourself up for failure and you're 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 really not reducing that gap between expectation and reality. Most real estate agents, most clients find satisfaction, they find happiness in in having a smaller variation between expectation and reality. So we really work with a real estate agent to prep them so that not only on this transaction they can have a great a great um experience but so that they can learn and on every transaction they can get better. So I think that's one of the things that really distinguishes us. The other thing is we're we're kind of nerdy and we we love to to study and create content for presentations and trainings. We do a lot of trainings on different subjects. Today we're going to talk a little bit about real estate closing costs. Uh, uh, tomorrow I'm launching a new a new course on cybersecurity. Uh, at another broker. So it's going to be the first cybersecurity training that we give. We've been training ourselves in cybersecurity for about two, three years. We spent large sums of money on the issue of security, both for the agents as well as for the clients. Uh, I actually got invited to a conference where FBI and Secret Service are going to be presenting um, you know, new, like the new tactics of the bad guys, which are getting better and better and better. Uh, I'm going to be in Austin in early December talking about cybersecurity and title issues. So we're we're constantly trying to 
keep real estate agents updated on the things that are going to get money in their pocket or whatever is going to prevent that. And and that really comes down to the closing. So I really appreciate Jacqueline this opportunity. Um, I don't know if there's any questions before I start, or if you guys just want me to to dive in a bit. No, dive right in. Um, you know, I I we talked a little bit, but it's been a, a while now. Um, you know, we we're talking about how the anything you can you can mention because a lot of the agents on here are pretty seasoned, and so anything. So there's quite a mix. There's some some newer agents and some seasoned, but. For those seasoned agents, especially, you know, how are the new changes with NAR and compensation, maybe how they'll affect closing costs and what some of the options might be going forward and, and just maybe throwing that in there whenever you can, you know, kind of alluding to that. I think sure. Helpful. Sure. So I'm going to, you know, I feel that always coming back to the basics, even if you're seasoned is worth it because it, it kind of repositions you to, to think more simply. I think there's been a lot of noise around the NER thing when actually it's very, very basic and it comes down to the basics. And it is basically who in the transaction will pay the compensation. That is all that is asking. Yep. Traditionally, we've just seen it coming out of the seller's side, but it could come from the buyer's side. And whoever it comes from, it has to be transparent. And so are, as a broker, are you seeing a lot of buyer broker agreements coming on your desk? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that was always our, our practice anyway at our company. That was always our policy, you know, and we would let it slide certainly sometimes, you know, and here in the keys, we start working with buyers sometimes several years in advance before they buy, because there's not a need to buy. It's a lifestyle purchase. It's a, it's a want, it's a desire. So it takes time for them to wrap their heads around, okay, let me spend a million dollars on my vacation home or more. Um, so a lot of times we would get the relationship established by going to meet them at the property and chatting with them and getting to know them and, and then moving towards the buyer broker when they got more serious. So that's going to be a struggle for us a little bit because, you know, we've had that happen a few times. They're like, well, I, I'm just here to look. I'm not really ready yet. And that's fine. And we're going to weed out all of that, that time that we're wasting essentially, but we're also losing that opportunity to um, start to build the relationship a little bit with them by saying, you know, sorry, we can't, we can't show it to you without a buyer broker agreement signed. Um, so we have to be more um, flexible on that or, you know, find ways to get them to sign something, temporary agreement, um, commission agreement. Well, you, yeah, agreement. you can use a showing agreements and, and things yeah. that are a little bit, you know, a little yeah. bit less um, threatening. But, but I actually think that the fact that this NER settlement got so much bad publicity, you know, there's no such thing as bad publicity, say the publicists, but, but basically, you know, there are many, many states where this is the practice. So one, you know, knowing those states for you, where you probably get a lot of people out of the state. Am I, am I correct? You get people oh, yeah. coming to the, okay. So understanding where they're coming from and what the, what the custom is there, because there was already, I think, seven states where this was the way. Mm -hmm. And all this publicity that the NAR settlement is getting, I just believe it almost gives you the cover to say, look, I'm not trying to pressure you, but I have certain rules that I must follow as a broker to ensure that I can that I can best serve you. Right. My mm -hmm. idea is not to, you know, make you commit to something you may not be ready for, but even to show you the properties, we just need to develop some relationship. And, you know, if it, if it doesn't work out, then then we don't need to keep dating. Like I'm not going to force you to be there. However, if it does work out, this shows that there is transparency and we can build trust in the relationship. We could be open with each other. And, you know, my commitment is to, to try and negotiate on your behalf so that you can get the best possible deal writ large. Yeah. That includes all, all the costs. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so, you know, the commissions are just a, a part of that. Right. It, it, and, and, and personally, I think this is a huge plus because before, whether the client knew or not, all those commissions were built into the price, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and and so um, so that's I, that, gonna be one of the tricky things too in valuing properties. And um, but you know, it is what it is. I think we'll we'll figure it out. <laughs> I uh, I've made public arguments, um, you know, 
at, at different forums and conferences where that I get invited to saying that, you know, the general valuation of, of real estate in, in the United States has basically about 5% built in for real estate commissions and costs. And it probably has built in another one to 2% of additional costs. If you go into the real estate market to value where the seller will not pay the buyer commissions, the big question remains, will, this, will the general state of prices across the real estate industry drop about two and a half percent, right? If it's true. Yeah. And so I think sellers are going to be faced with a reality whereby as it is, many sellers have an inflated notion of value that their property is worth more than it really is. They have always subjected themselves to these appraisals. And now, like, I just think the math does funny things in their head. One of the ways that Folio can help is we do a lot of scenario um, planning with real estate agents so that they can guide their clients and their listings. Um, we're actually working on a, on a technology tool now that will allow a real estate agent to compare three, four, five different scenarios for buyers and sellers. So it's funny because we're getting like, I don't know why, but very few buyer agents would ask me, what do the costs look like for the seller? And I always found it weird because this is one of the most transparent transactions you're ever going to get into because the contract says what the seller is getting. Really, the only factor that a buyer agent may not fully know, and if they dug around and did some math, they could approximate, but it's the mortgage. Mm -hmm. So you would know if you did homework how much the seller would keep under different scenarios. And I feel that's a very powerful tool that very few people leverage. Well, interestingly, I'm starting to get sellers asking me, well, what does the buyer's transaction look like, right? It's the same in reverse. And so if everybody has transparency based on what the contract says, then I think this is a much smoother negotiation. And let me let me dive in a bit here because, you know, we're going to cover a couple of things that for some of the veterans might seem a little repetitive, I'd love invite you to have an open mind so that we can place ourselves back in basics to to really give us some power to understand who pays for what and you know a summary of the closing costs and you know a very quick overview of different settlement statements and how we can how we can help you guys. So one of the most frequently asked questions that I get is who pays for what? And my answer is, well, it really depends on the contract. The contract tells you who pays for what. Now, you may not know the costs of all these things necessarily, but um, the contract tells you, especially if you use the as-is. Do you guys mostly use the as-is contract? Yes. Okay. So even if you don't use the as-is contract, almost every contract model that I've seen in Florida um, is aligned with this. I have seen some proprietary contracts. For example, Open Door has some proprietary contracts. Obviously, attorneys have the right to write their own contracts, but there's always a cost section. Now, I love using the as is as a starting point because it really details most of the costs that are involved in the real estate transaction. Now, if we look at um, paragraph 9A, these are the costs to be paid by the seller. I will send you guys a blog post that we wrote that break these down in great detail. Like how much exactly do these things cost? So for example, the doc stamps and surtax on the deed, the state of Florida has no income tax, right? That's why we love Florida. But, you know, Florida has to pay their bills. So how does Florida pay their bills? Florida pays their bills with sales tax, which is a, you know, a, a, a significant chunk of the revenue, but it, it's also real estate taxes. Now the municipalities keep most of the real estate tax. The transfer taxes, the transfer taxes get distributed amongst also the state. So these transfer taxes are a tax that is placed on the value of the purchase price. Okay. 
in Florida, it's usually 70 cents per every hundred in value. In Miami-Dade, it's 60 cents for every hundred in value, but Miami-Dade has surtaxes on everything that is not uh, residential, right? So in Miami-Dade, you could pay up to uh, 95 cents, right? And so that is usually a, a seller cost. Just last week, I actually got a contract where the seller crossed this out and they, they moved it to the buyer. And, um, you know, if you know how to do these scenarios or you use, you call Foley, you're like, hey, can you help me model this? Then you can kind of say, look, what I'm looking to gain is is this much money. Anything outside of this, we, we need to talk about, right? Now, some buyers will accept, some buyers, some buyers may not, right? Um, the, the title insurance policy, the owner's policy and charges, you know, if you look at these little blue squares, if you can make them out, I, they're blue because they depend on different sections of the contract. So the seller will pay for the only owner's policy and charges if in section 9C1, right? This is section 9C. This 9C1 is where the seller designates a closing agent and pays for the owner's policy, right? So paragraph 9A, where it's talking about the the seller expenses will say, well, if 9C1 is checked, then the owner is going to pay for the policy. Now, I know there's a lot of veterans on the call, so so I'm going to skip around a bit because, you know, I think you can you can handle it. But well, I just want to I just want to add a point there, um, yep. you know, where you're talking about these scenarios and moving the closing costs around. I think that's going to be really important right now, especially because prices did not go up you know, are not increasing at the moment. Um, so anybody who needs to sell right now and they they don't have the equity that in these previous years we've been we've been seeing plenty of equity. So this really didn't always come into as a factor. But right now people aren't if they needed to sell quickly, they just bought within the past year or two, there's not a, equity on the table. Um, so moving these scenarios around um, could really be helpful to make the 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 deal go through. It, it, it absolutely and it will demonstrate a completely different level of knowledge and professionalism on behalf of the real estate agent and quite frankly in my personal opinion i believe that it firmly builds much more transparency i mean these how many of your clients actually read the eyes this contract they, they don't read it and then they want to blame you for everything so here you can help them grasp really what they're talking about. And in terms of the owner's policy and charges, you know, this is set with a promulgated rate by the state. The state sets the insurance charges. I have a table here. These are the costs of owner's title insurance policies. This does not include the lender's title insurance policy, right? But depending on the price of the property, you know, you can see the cost of the title insurance policy as per the state. What I've done is I've, I've created, so percentage-wise, what does the policy cost? And I think it's it's better to visualize it. You can see on this graph in blue, um, you know, the cost of the title policy. And down here, you can see the, the price of the property. So obviously, a $5 million property has a larger insurance premium. But percentage-wise is this red line. You could see that it comes down, and after a million bucks, it really drops. So on a $5 million property, you're seeing that the cost of insurance is about 0.35%, right? If we go to the graph, oh, sorry, point, yeah, 0.31%. Now, on a $250,000 policy, it's 0.5%. Th this is a function of how the state charges for title insurance. Now, remember this as we go through the the conversation because when we get to the CD, the CD does not show what I am telling you. The CD is not a state document. It is a federal document. And the federal government has created regulation so that the way the title insurance premiums are stated on the CD and shown are completely different then they're shown in the state. Okay. So when your clients look at the CD, 
if you do not know about this, they're going to say, why is this so expensive? This is not what you told me. So I'll show you guys how to how to do that. Are there any questions so far? Because I can't see anybody on the screen, so I don't know if if I'm just plowing through or. No questions here. No, I think it's it's you're doing great. Awesome. <laughs> so if we keep going with the seller expenses, we have these title search charges. Okay, these title search charges would only apply to the seller when the Miami Dade Broward Regional Provision is selected. Nine C three. What does title search related charges mean? It actually means the title search, which if you look at over here, contractually is 200 bucks, right? Some title agents or some underwriters will charge 150 or something like that, but it's up to 200. And then the other part is the lien search. So the lien search charges really depend on the municipality, on if they have any extra expenses and on the use of a third party. So for example, we have a company that specializes in lien searches. They they only do lien searches and estoppels. They charge, you know, a hundred bucks for the lien search. So if the county charges 300 bucks for the lien search plus a hundred bucks, it's 400 bucks, right? So that, 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 when the, when the Miami-Dade Broward Regional Provision is checked, that's what they're talking about, right? And you can see here the municipal lien search. Uh, if we go back to the seller, here is the lien search. So it says the lien search gets paid for by the seller in option one or option three. FERPTA, do you guys deal a lot with FERPTA? Uh, no, not that often. Yeah. So we about 40% about of our deals have FERPTA and about 70% of our clients are international. Wow. So this is a monumental pain in the butt. And it is on FERPTA transactions, I would say that FERPTA related issues take about 80% of the client's energy wow. because um, they want to know why, why, why. Um, you know, there's a lot of noise in the in the media about foreigners and immigrants and all this. People think that they're being targeted by, you know, the big bad government because they're foreigners. And that's not true. FERPTA was a law that was enacted by, by Ronald Reagan in 1981 in part to, to stop money laundering in real estate. There was a ton of, you know, illicit money that was going into real estate. People would buy the property, sell the property, take the money and go back to their country with clean money. Mm -hmm. So what FERPTA does is it ensures that the onus of proving if a foreigner owes tax or not, they put it onto the buyer because quite literally the government tells the buyer, I know where you live. So if you don't find out if the foreign, if this seller is foreigner, I'm going to come to you for the tax. So naturally the title agent, the closing agent has to kind of execute this on the closing statement. So anything related to FERPTA, which is a seller responsibility, you know, this is actually a new change, by the way. FERPTA has always been a seller responsibility, but they added explicitly these expenses to the contract in the changes that were made in 2023. Then the seller has to pay, you know, for the estoppel fees, for anything that needs to be recorded to cure title and seller attorney fees, right? This other line... I've seen some very stealthy agents stick all sorts of things in this other line. I prefer that anything that is between the buyer and the seller gets put in the additional terms. But for example, I've seen many brokers put their broker compliance fees here, right? Mm -hmm. So, you yeah. know, 395 to Better Homes and Garden or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've seen it done there. I've also seen a very high correlation with title companies, when we represent sellers and a buyer brings their title company, let's say, I've seen a very high correlation with things getting missed when they're put into this other. Because the title agent is flying through the contract and since most people leave it blank, you know, their eyes just don't see that something is there. Yeah, and all the technology today, DocuSign, it look, you, you use look like the same font. I don't like anything being changed on the contract either. We just rec for record, everybody out there, make sure you do use the additional terms or an addendum or the counteroffer form because things get so easily overlooked. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Now, in terms of the buyer cost, well, the buyer pay the taxes and recording fees on notes and mortgage. This is, again, it, you know, if you look up Florida Department of Revenue taxes and fees on notes and mortgages, you'll find a, an entire chapter of the Florida Revenue Code. Well, you'll actually find a summary, which in the blog I'm going to share, we, we, we summarized it because otherwise, you know, you know, you'd fall asleep. But, but essentially, it breaks down um, these transfer taxes. And, and the buyer is paying on the value of the note or the mortgage. This is where you get such big variations in, in the closing cost percentages between a cash deal and a loan deal. When you add these taxes and recording fees on notes and mortgages, obviously you have the lender fees. But just this one little piece will add somewhere between, you know, 0.2 and 0.5% of the closing of the purchase price to your cost, just these taxes and mortgages. We closed um, a $22 million deal not long ago, and there was a, like a $12 million mortgage. I mean, the taxes on these on these transactions can get large, right? Wow. Um, the recording fees for the deed and the and the mortgage, right? So you guys must know county recorders, you know, a very arcane uh, science. Um, they charge per page. A deed is usually three pages, $10 a first page, $8.50 every subsequent page. So a deed basically costs about 27 bucks to record, plus the e-recording fees, right? So, and, and why do I tell you this? Because these are the fees that like either people completely skip over or they find to be super annoying. Like, you know, you have thousands and thousands of dollars of closing fees, but a $27 recording charge and then a 9.50 e recording charge. And people are like, for God's sakes, are you, are you serious? But you know, mm -hmm. this is what the contract says. Then we're back to the owner's policy, right? If you look at it, this is saying the owner's policy is going to be paid by the buyer. Uh, if, if paragraph nine C two is checked, right? This is nine C two the owner's policy and charges, right? Now, it also says over here that the owner's policy premium is charged if 9C3 is checked, which is the Miami-Dade Broward Regional Provision. So like, what's the difference? Well, the difference is if 9C2 is checked, you pay for the owner's policy and the settlement fee and the title search and the lien search. If 9C3 is checked, we already established that the title search and the lien search is being paid for by the seller, but the owner's policy and the settlement fee by the buyer. So in summary, when it comes to title insurance and the and, and the and the closing agent, 9C1, it's all paid by the seller. 9C2, it's all paid by the buyer. 9C3, it's basically split. We okay. we typically use 93C, uh, the Miami Dade Broward Regional Provision, and we do have trouble sometimes with, mm -hmm. especially with agents in the lower keys, because they're not as used to seeing it for some reason. And so um, we've had we have to either argue it to say it's just the name of the provision. We can anybody can use it. If it were just a Miami Dade thing, if there would be a separate addendum. This is on a Florida contract. Anybody can use it. Um, so we usually have to educate. Um, or sometimes just to keep it simple, we won't use it because we know that it's going to complicate the transaction because of the confusion in the name. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I get myself into this discussion more times than I than I'd like to. The reason they put Miami Dade Broward Regional Provision is because Miami Dade and Broward always want to feel special. <laughs> um, but essentially, that provision it says we're just going to split fees. That that's really all it means, right now. You know, my webinars have been known to put people to sleep because of my deep, great voice. And this is boring stuff and I get it, but I'll spare you guys. And what I've created for you guys that I hope will be very helpful is kind of a visual summary, right? Nice. That that will show you side by side what each of the options means. So what I did is I took everything in, in 9A I took everything in 9B and I took everything in 9C and I create a little table for you that summarizes it. So if 9C1 is checked, who pays for what? If 9C2 is checked, who pays for what? 
And if 9C3 is checked, who pays for what? Now, if you're very observant, right, and you have to go back to your days of, of you know, being seven and eight and nine years old and, you know, going to a magic show and trying to figure out where the magician was trying to trick you, I'll give you a clue. It's in the red box. So the portion of this uh, show that is magic is in the red box. If you see 9C1, everything is on the seller side. And if you go to 9C2, everything is on the buyer side in the red box, but everything else stays the same. And if you go to 9C3, it's split, but everything else stays the same. So that's the extent of the magic of the show. All it means is how we are distributing the costs related to the title insurance and the actual settlement. People don't read through these paragraphs because they're boring and they're they're written in attorney language. I am not an attorney. So for my own peace of mind, I had to break it down in very simple English. And that's what it means. So I'm going to stop there before I move on. Um, do you guys have any questions? Any thumbs up if this is jiving with people or thumbs down if if I completely lost you? You guys can use the little thumbs up on your uh, on your reaction. Um, okay. Oh, you got a, you got a thumbs up. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, you know, I think it looks great. Um, that is super helpful to have those those little charts. I love the visuals. Yep. So yeah. Awesome. Now I don't know if you guys knew, but there is actually uh, I've been I've been I've been sold this idea that there is actually a method to the madness on distributing title charges. Yeah. This. This is coming from our underwriter. And, you know, if you ask Stuart, if you ask any of the underwriters, they have a similar map. This shows you where it is customary for the buyer to pay and for the seller to pay. Okay. So if you if you just visually do, do some math, most of the state, the seller pays for title insurance. Right. There's a lot more white than, than blue. Ooh. It just turns out that where it's blue, it is where if you add up the number of transactions, it's a large part of the total transactions in the state. So just Miami-Dade and Broward are about 10% of the transactions in the state. Wow. Right? Now, once you get out here to the Tampa area, and once you get out here to the Orlando Metro, so all of this Central Florida, this is where there's been the most growth in transactions, right? Over the last uh, several years. Um, now, in the end, all of this is negotiable. And now think about, let me give you a personal theory. A personal theory I have is why does it make sense ever for a buyer not to pay for the title transaction and the title insurance? The one who is going to live there or own that property in the future is the buyer. They want their people in charge of this. So in all these counties where the seller pays, I have been hired by sellers who have gotten upset because they think we're too transparent. I don't know what the hell that means. Like, there's only one way to do this, which is the right way. You can't get hired and, like, hide something. And, like, I have, I've had this conversation many, many times. So this leads me to reinforce my theory that buyers should be wanting to pay for this. Now, how do you get a buyer to pay for something that they're customarily not willing to pay? Well, one easy way to do it is in the contract, you choose the, 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 the second option where the buyer is going to pay. And then you look, you call folio and you look at our graph and you say, well, the cost of the policy is going to be 4,000 bucks. I'm going to ask for a $4,000 credit. Mm -hmm. Buyer and seller agree that seller shall credit the buyer $4,000 at closing. And the uh, seller is going to say, why am I going to give you $4,000? Well, you, were you needed to pay for the policy anyway. So all I'm asking you is I'd like to get my title agent. And essentially, this is about the cost of the policy. That's fair. Yeah. Completely fair. The seller is not necessarily going to have any more or less expense. It's just the buyer feels comfortable with their title people. Now, are there situations where the buyer customarily pays, but the seller wants to control the closing or should control the closing? Mm -hmm. My postulation is that there are some scenarios where that makes sense. And I'll tell you which ones. 
they're primarily related to if the seller is a foreigner or if the seller is a control freak or both. <laughs> yeah. Foreigners have much more complex transactions. There's a lot more nuance, logistics, FERPTA, 1031 exchanges, you know, gifts, LLCs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When there is more layers to the seller onion, it makes more sense for the seller to, to do it. And the reverse is true. In Miami-Dade and Broward, for example, if the buyer customarily pays for the title insurance, how do you, why would the seller want to pay for the title insurance? Nobody wants to pay more money. I don't care how much money you have. Nobody wants to spend more money than they need to. Mm -hmm. Well, the seller could say, look, I'm going to choose a title agent per contract. That's legal. Uh, I would, you know, I basically, the cost of the title policy is built into the price, just like the commissions. So if you know the policy costs 4,000 bucks, when you're negotiating the price, you're keeping those 4,000 bucks in your mind as you're negotiating the final price. I was told that this was not possible to do from the point of view that nobody would go for it. People think it's like a sales gimmick, but it's not. Because when you have this foreigner who is out of control, they don't speak English and they need their people like Folio to take over and like really hold their hand, then the only way to do that is to control the closing legally, mm -hmm. even if you're in Miami, Dade and Broward. So there you would go and you would choose option one in the contract. Okay. You go there and choose option one. And in your final price, you just basically make sure that the cost of the policy is built in. Okay. Yeah. So those are some, some negotiating things. Now we're going to dive a little bit deeper into summarizing these expenses. You know, you have your title related expenses right? Your government recording fees and taxes, other closing costs, loan related expenses, and lender required prepaids and escrows. This is how I see the world of closing expenses. Um, so looking at these closing expenses this way will allow you to break down um will allow you to look at different forms of, of settlement statements and know where you're situated. There's a lot of different formats for costs. You have quote formats. You have estimated seller proceed formats. You have loan estimates that look very much like closing disclosures. You have estimated loan fees, that right? Lender fees. You have all sorts of formats that are all trying to kind of hit at more or less the same thing, but it's very hard to compare apples to apples. I don't know who 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 did this or why, or if it was intentional to confuse the crap out of people, um, but this is the way of the world. So I try to break it down into little buckets to try and see and know what I'm looking at. So title-related expenses. Here we're talking about title insurance. Here we're talking about lien searches title searches, and settlement fees, okay? You know, title insurance is a promulgated rate set by the state. I already went through that. Lien searches vary by city and county. Title searches are usually about 200 for residential, 275 for commercial, plus minus, and settlement fees vary widely. I've seen agents charge 350 bucks for settlement fees. I've seen attorneys charge $5,000 for settlement fees. We usually charge about 1295 Um which is a fixed amount. I, I've never really lost a deal based on pricing, but I have seen a very, very high correlation between lower settlement fees and higher title insurance premiums. And the question is why? Isn't the title insurance premium set by the state? The answer is it is. They have a minimum promulgated rate. So agents, title agents, compensate sometimes with low settlement fees and they jack up the cost of the insurance. What's the difference? It's very difficult. Can you guys hear me? Hello? Did I lose you? I can hear you. Maybe Jacqueline oh. got lost, but I can oh, hear okay. you. Oh, great. Thank you. I can you. hear you also. Thank yeah, you. I, I was... can hear you too. Oh, great, great. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think Jackie got frozen. Okay, good. I thought I was just talking to myself, which I do often. Um, 
So a lot of title agents will just jack up the cost of the insurance, which is not particularly illegal. Um, they just know that most people don't know how to calculate title insurance. So nobody's going to question if the title insurance premium is 500 bucks more. If you're normal, you know, if you're charging a 350 settlement fee, but you put 500 bucks more in the in the title insurance, it's like you had an 850 settlement fee. And now the difference with your competitors is not that much. So that's something to really be aware of. Now, in terms of government recording and fees, you know, here you're breaking down the deed recording, the mortgage recording. We talked about the county recorder fees, the doc stamps, right? This is straight from the Department of Revenue. Doc stamps on the mortgage are 35 cents per every hundred in value. And then the intangible tax, which is 20 cents for every hundred in value, right? I'm going to give you all these resources. You guys can geek out with, with some of the, of the articles. Um, other closing related expenses. Well, you have broker fees, which are these compliance fees. You have surveys, you have estoppels, um, you have courier wire and tech fees, right? These are third party fees on, on a closing. You have loan related expenses, right? You have processing fees by the lender, underwriting fees, appraisal fees, credit reports and points, which those of you that have been closing buyers over the last 24 months have seen this skyrocket, right? Which which is, is what happens when there's a lot of volatility and higher interest rates in the market. It costs more money to close these deals. Then you have the lender required prepaids and escrows, right? Um, now, the prepaid interests are charged because from you know the date of closing till the next date of the month because usually interests are charged in arrears. So they need to make up for these first few days of interest until you get your statement, right? That you're going to pay for the money that you used. And so that's why the prepaid interests are there. Now, you know that most lenders will require the first year of the homeowner insurance policy to be paid. But then in addition, they usually ask you for an additional three months in deposit. And then depending on the on the month of the year, when you close, they'll ask you, you know, for 13 months sometimes or, or three months sometimes, right? It'll depend on the lender. Now, these required escrows and prepaids are there to reduce the lender's risk. The only people who can get in front of the lender in terms of, you know, their position are the government. And, um, you know, if something catastrophic happens to your property, then the value of the asset for the lender goes down. So they want to they wanna ensure that this that this uh, gets paid, okay? These, in my experience, is where clients have the most shock because they're paying attention to the actual cost in the transaction when what they're thinking is how much money do I need to bring to the closing table? If you do not include in your initial conversations with the client cost and cash, then there's gonna be a disconnect. And the client is expecting costs of 3%, but cash of 5%. Where's the difference? It's right here in the lender required as prepaids and escrows. Why is does this generate so much tension? Because when you get the lender's initial disclosure, many times these prepaids and escrows are like in a subsection at the bottom. You know that clients, they, they just, they go to the bottom of where it says total cost and that's what they look at but they don't read the rest of the document. That rest of the document is right here. So you could be looking at half a percent to one and a half percent of a difference in the need for cash at closing over here. If your client is not expecting that, they're gonna have a rude awakening. And then it's gonna be, well, whose fault is it? Is it my real estate agent's fault because they didn't explain it to me? Is it my lender's fault? Did he trick me or did she trick me? Is it the title company's fault because they didn't catch it? And the reality is, you know, we don't know what we don't know. Our clients don't know what they don't know. So as real estate agents, my proposal is don't ever get to whose fault is it anyway. Get to, hey, let's be proactive. We want to make sure that you understand what you need to bring to the closing table. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. This also reduces a lot of friction at the end. You know, the end should be, you know, the celebration, let's drink some champagne, we, milestone in our life. You know, you don't want to be like that friction on the closing table. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't really know, whatnot. 
So here's a handy dandy summary. Here are the five sections of the closing costs, what you can expect to pay in a cash deal and what you can expect to pay with a mortgage. So here it allows you to really break it down. Okay. So hopefully these summaries will be really, really useful to you guys. Okay. Yeah. Now let's move on real quick to talking about some, some numbers. So if you purchase a property in cash, how much, what percentage of the closing cost as a percentage of the, of the purchase price do you need for these first three sections? On average, it's about 0.75 to 1.5. But the reality is that this is relative to the purchase price. So when you start getting in the 2 million plus range of properties, this starts dropping like a rock because the fixed costs of the transaction get amortized much faster. So on a $22 million deal, this could be 0.2%. You know, but 0.2% of $22 million is a lot of money. But this is what it looks like in cash. Now, there's no loan related expense here, obviously, and no lender fees. So the total closing cost, you know, on a on an average deal in Miami Dade Broward, you know, Monroe County is going to be about 0.75 to 1.5. Maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more. Now, with a mortgage, you have the same amount uh, of fees over here. It'll probably tend to be more on the higher side because of the intangible taxes and, and doc stamps on the deed. But when you start adding the loan related expenses and the lender required pre uh, prepays and escrows, you start seeing that you're getting from a total of about 1% to about 4%. And people want to understand why. And, and here's the reason why, right? You have some additional expenses here and obviously, you know, the prepaid, the, uh, the mortgage doc stamps in this. So again, I'll open it up for questions. How does this sound to you guys? That right there is super helpful. People always ask, you know, what my close, what are my closing costs going to be? And of course, we don't like to say what they are because it's, there's so many variables, and that's out. That's not our wheelhouse. So we try to connect with the title company. But to be able to spit out an approximate, you know, if you're paying, you know, if you're getting a mortgage, it's probably going to be somewhere around four yeah. um, percent of the purchase price is is really helpful to be able to just give a rough estimate so they know. And and, and if you're giving a buyer consultation far in advance or a first time home buyer, you know, this is what you're going to need to save up for, or we can ask for credits, but this is what we're going to be looking at. This is very helpful. Good. I'm glad. Now, where, where I feel that in the last, especially 12 months, this is, this is getting more difficult. Jacqueline is because of the large rise in buyer paid compensation to the mortgage brokers. It's really tipping this scale. Like I'm starting to see five and a half, six percent, because this over here is getting to two and a half percent, right? So these, it's yeah, point, really, yeah. really important that this gets broken down, and that's why you know, for me, you know, I I need to I need things to be explained like a like a you know like a seven year old and just like really simple. Like that's why creating these nerdy like tables just helps me visualize and break things down and really move the conversation forward with a client to make them feel empowered. Like I don't feel I'm selling anything to the client. I'm not trying to convince them of anything in this graph. I'm trying to talk to them about the reality. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if the client brings their lender and their lender's charging them two and a half points, you know, this is going to go up. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about settlement statements because this phrase settlement statement is kind of this broad term, right? A settlement statement is essentially any kind of document that breaks down, you know, the income and expenses in a particular transaction and how they're distributed. That's like the broadest based definition. Obviously real estate um, has these components associated with, with costs and financial details. So you're usually looking at something, a settlement statement, including, and this is also relevant to like when you buy or sell a business, right? We don't do business closings, but the logic applies. Um, you know, you have your sale price, your insurance costs, loan information, property taxes, other closing costs, prepaid expenses, and then adjustments, right? So in some counties you prepay the tax in other counties it's in arrears, 
Um, sometimes you prepay the HOA. In uh, others, you haven't paid the HOA, so you have to pay them back. And then the, the commissions. Um, there are different types of settlement statements that we commonly use. So the closing disclosure is one that we all know and love. This was basically imposed by the federal government after the 2008-2009 financial um, blow up um, in real estate. They wanted to make it more transparent for the client. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that they also created a lot of rules around it. But essentially, this is a federally mandated document that is used in real estate, residential real estate transactions that are financed with a commercial mortgage. Um, for example, if you go to a private lender, they're not bound by the rules of CDs, so they don't have to use it. But, you know, for Freddie, Fannie, the check the box kind of traditional vanilla mortgages, you need a closing disclosure. OK, now it includes loan terms and projected monthly payments and a couple of other things. Right. This is the federal government's attempt to making it simpler to read. So the first page you know, has quite a bit of interesting information, including what does the monthly escrows include and what doesn't include? What it what does it not include? But it's also confusing because it'll tell you, okay, this is how much you, you pay per month outside of the interest and, and, and principal. But if the HOA fee is put into there, if you try to add them up, it's it's not going to give you your monthly payment. So you, you kind of have to navigate it and I'm happy to kind of answer some questions about it. Um, if you guys are really into um, closing disclosures, you know, um, I don't know if this is a closing disclosure kind of crowd, but the CFPB has an amazing, amazing website that dives really deep. They use a lot of colors um, and they have it. I don't know if you guys can see up here. They have the closing disclosure explainer in like 14 different languages. Right. Oh, I so, never knew that. Yeah. So like they have it in many, many, many languages. Right. As a, with all things federal government, if like they don't do it for everybody, they don't do it for anybody. But, you know, this is a, a big asset. You can go through page by page, block by block, line by line, and it highlights them. It tells you exactly what it means. So this is a really great website if you guys want to geek out a little bit on the CD. Now, the Alta Settlement Statement is a settlement statement format that was created by the American Land Title Association. This is what most closing agents use, right? So usually in a closing, you'll see that if there's a CD, the CD needs to be signed for the bank, but the the the, the closing agent asks you for the Alta settlement statement. It's pretty similar to the HUD-1 settlement statement, and I'll show you now. The HUD-1 settlement statement um, used to be the federally mandated format before the CD. Um, there is still a lot of HUD ones that are used, especially on commercial transactions or on private loan transactions. So the Alta and the HUD are kind of mutually exclusive, but the CD is not. So you may need a CD and an Alta or a HUD. Different closing agents will use different ones. The biggest difference is on the formatting, where here you'll see that the seller and the buyer have debits and credits like simultaneously, right? This actually also happens on the CD, but if you don't look closely enough, you won't see it. This is page three of the CD. So on page three, where it says a summary, you actually get the debits and credits like you would in a HUD one. Um, and it'll show them side by side. The Alta, what it does is it basically puts them on the same line. And you know, many times a debit for one is a credit for the other. So that that's basically the only the only difference. Um, so, you know, what makes us different as a company? Our values, you know, sounds cheesy, but it's true kind of kind of thing. Like we're a group of professionals that really enjoy what we do and we want to do things right. We live in a in a in an area in Miami where I think most people look at Miami and think it's a bunch of crazy pirates running around with like knives in their mouths. Um, but well, that's you, here. <laughs> well, you know, we, we actually believe in transparency and, 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 you know, we, we know that we have to problem solve throughout the transaction hand in hand with the, uh, with a real estate agent. We have a great team with a lot of experience. We really focus on this aspect of partnership. 
Um, we know every transaction is different. So we have this methodology called context-based processing, which allows us to get in front of a lot of things. Um, we know that there's a difference between expectation and reality. We want to really just focus on what we can control and, and really set the right expectations. And, you know, we have a track record where we've been named top 25 in the state. We have over 150 Google five-star ratings. And, you know, we try and kind of let clients speak for us. Um, we have a lot of stages of support, pre-contract, everything that has to do with reviewing the business terms of the contract before clients execute, closing cost estimates. We do onboarding calls on every executed transaction where we introduce to the client exactly what we need to get this closed. And we start trying to front load so that we can get it out of the way. Here, we really need a lot of help from the real estate agent. We create WhatsApp groups for every transaction. I would say about 90% of our clients take us up on the offer. The beauty of WhatsApp is that one, it's completely secure and encrypted. Two, most of our clients already use it. And so they feel very comfortable. They feel they have direct access to our teams and it's very fluid. Um, we assign transaction teams where you'll have like basically one point of contact managing the transaction. And internally, we have a lot of support teams. So we have onboarding teams, we have the attorney, we have the, the accounting, we have different teams that will focus on different parts of the transaction, but you, the real estate agent, have this one point of contact. We close anywhere in the world. We were one of the first companies in Florida to do a completely virtual closing, essentially the second week of COVID. Um, you know, sometimes it's better to be lucky to be good. We had just gotten our, our RON notarization license. We had, you know, about 50% of our transactions with sellers from out of the country when COVID hit. We either found a way to close them or we were out of business. And we found a way to close them with virtual uh, with virtual closings. We're one of the leading virtual closing companies in Florida. We've done over 300 transactions in Latin America, uh, Asia, and Europe. And our clients love the fact that we have really, really strict security protocols that will guarantee them security in the transaction while also you know, being wherever they are. And then we have a, a dedicated post-closing support team. So that's a little bit about us. Um, I appreciate you guys coming and, and listening. I, I'd love to hear, you know, a quick feedback from each of you, questions, conversations, how you guys think, if so, we can work together, how we can support you. And I really appreciate Jacqueline uh, giving us the space for this. Yeah, thank oh, you. Sorry. No, please. If, and if you guys want to turn on your videos for a moment so you can say hello and and, uh, and have a minute to chat, please go go right ahead. I actually had a quick question, if it's okay, going back to the settlement statements. Yeah. For example, if you have the seller and the buyer is getting a loan, would you as would your seller typically get the CD or would they get an Alta statement for the same transaction? Because that's showing some fairly personal stuff. Can you address mm -hmm. that a second? Absolutely. So the they uh, they came up with a seller CD, okay, which doesn't show any of the buyer's kind of personal information. So the seller will sign a seller CD and an alter statement where they'll see basically the amount of the loan, but they won't see like the interest rates and 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 other things um, involved. Um, okay. So the seller will basically sign the alter. The, the other question I have in that department is with some closings, I've gotten a uh, Alta statement or a HUD or, you know, whatever the equivalent kind of early on in the transaction. And in other transactions, I've had to like ask for it when I don't have it two days before closing. So is there a protocol for that? That's a very good question. There are very strict protocols around the CD. And those strict protocols are very unclear to most people. And so that generates a lot of frustration on the part of the CD because the CD, by law, the buyer needs to sign off on it at least three days before closing. Different lenders will send it at different moments and different lenders will send it with different levels of completion. Some lenders will send it having incorporated all of the fees that were presented at the beginning of the transaction when it was disclosed and that's all. And there's been other stuff that has evolved in the transaction like HOA operations or capital contributions. Some lenders will say, give me your latest CD 
because I'm going to publish my CD to the to the buyer. So when it comes to the CD, the only the buyer gets a copy. Usually not even the real estate agents get a copy. Real estate agents get a copy because the buyer forwards it to you or shares it with you. Title never sees that initial pre-CD. We sent our, our figures on day one or day two of the transaction. So if there are expenses on the buyer side, like capital contributions for an HOA or like um, a collection of uh, a collection that is being required by the lender, they may not see it in that pre-CD and it's legal and the lender signs it and we don't get a copy. So that's one source of like mismatched expectations. You as a real estate agent, what you can coach your client on is that when you get this, the pre-CD, let's just send it a title because the secret is that title can begin working on the final version of the CD that they're going to balance with the lender but from the pre-CD, but the lender only sends it to you after the three days have passed. So that's one issue on the pre-CD. On the Alta, um, on cash deals, you could get an Alta pretty early, a draft Alta, right? Um, we get asked for Altas, and depending on the transaction, sometimes we're more or less nervous about publishing it, um, especially when we don't have a Stopples, because, you know, we get very little disclosure about these condos. So we ask a thousand times, for example, is there more than one association? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She pays it. She pays one bill. The estoppel comes and there's two other associations. You do pay one bill, but those associations have related expenses and charges like capital contributions. And so we can send on a cash deal an estimate pretty early. Um. On loan deals, it's m almost impossible to send out an Alta early. And I'll tell you why. We do not, we are not privy to the prepaids and escrows that the lender supposedly disclosed in their first loan estimate. The loan estimate was supposed to be disclosed after the title company provided their fees. Some lenders do it, some lenders don't. So the first time that we really see the prepaids and escrows is when we get a copy of the pre-CD, which sometimes is the day before closing. So putting that into the Alta is almost impossible without that full information. And this is a source of frustration for a lot of people. This is especially a source of frustration for the client who did not choose the title agent. Because the title agent is working on these documents, but if you're the seller and the buyer chose... The seller is dying for an estimate of their figures. But as a seller's representative, like if if my if Nelson, my business partner, represents a seller as an attorney, we have zero visibility to these closing statements. Right? So we're hounding the closing agent, asking them for visibility for the seller. So this is some of the dynamic that is going on, right? And the client is talking to the lender five times a day, and the lender is giving them all sorts of information. And you know. What I've come to terms with so that I don't torture myself mentally and spiritually over every transaction, I've come to terms that everybody involved in the transaction wants to do the best for the client and the lender never lies to the client. It's just never the full information. And that just plays out in terms of expectation. So if as a real estate agent, you can kind of coach your client on these expectations, I think there's less friction. And I really enjoy a real estate agent that is, you know, non-judgmental, but they're really a quarterback where they're just trying to get people on the same page because the lenders, most of them don't feel they need to really do anything with title except get clean title. And I think that's a big mistake because it basically means that you're having two levels of conversations with the client, whatever the lender wants to have, and then everything else is somebody else's problem. And I think that that creates, that creates friction with the client. It doesn't create such a pleasant experience. For the real estate agents, it's, it's maddening because you're trying to like get all these pieces and like give the client the right answer and, and you're not fully in control. Um, and this is an important realization. Like once a contract is signed, you may still be the quarterback, but real estate agents really have very little control after the contract is signed, right? Like the, the lender says that they're in the driving seat, but really... You know, it's it's really the title company who's in the driving seat. But the loan officer is telling the, the buyer a bunch of things as if they were in the driving seat. And there's a bunch of stuff that's missing. 
that is outside of their control. So I, I really like that that WhatsApp chat group because everybody can be on the same page. We could be talking to each other as a team or we have a conference call. We say, hey, let's all talk for, for a couple minutes and let's get our ducks in a row. How does that sound? Well, that sounds good. One other question related like to that. When Oh, sorry. If you, so you mentioned that you might not get that statement until days, you know, the day before the closing. What if you've already mailed out it may, what if it's a mail away for for one of the parties and you've already sent them the documents and they've already signed them and sent it back? Can you get an e-sign on that settlement statement or? The short answer is yes. We probably, if it is a, if there's a CD involved, we have not sent the documents without a final CD. If it's a cash deal, yeah, we send a lot of cash deals with draft HUDs. They get signed days before closing and when everything is ready, we, we resend a HUD by e-sign and we, we sign the HUD by eSign. Many lenders do not accept CDs signed by eSign, but more and more lenders are accepting the CD signed by eSign. So it'll kind of sometimes depend on the lender. But but usually in a mail away closing, we wouldn't send the docs without um without the CD being ready. One of Folio's very strict security protocols, which is annoying to real estate agents until you understand why, we do not allow clients to go and to their own notary to notarize, our standard practice is that we will send you a notary that we know anywhere in the country. We have very strong relationships with vetted notaries that are also vetted by the title insurance underwriters, but a, a very large source of fraud, which is kind of less prevalent on the buyers, it's more prevalent on the sellers, but a very you know big blind spot for fraud is the use of mobile notaries. Now, if the client, you know, we had a client in Chicago who owned a real estate company. They had notaries in their office. We basically got, we can use it, but we need to take a couple of steps. First of all, we're going to get underwriter's approval so that everybody's protected. Second, we're going to get all their licensing and E&O coverages and everything into our file. And we're going to do our own little investigation, right? Um this is really important for security. The bad guys are getting smarter and smarter and smarter. And so at the cost of annoying some people with how strict we are, we feel very strongly that protecting everybody's money in the transaction is, is just really worth it. So that would be true for the seller also. They could not sign in advance without the CD, even though they might not even see the CD. They might be given an Ulta. That's a great point because for the seller, it is a little bit different. Like we try to get seller doc signed as soon as we have a title commitment for, for logistics sake. So usually the seller will sign their settlement statement electronically um, if it's not ready. So, you know, we have a lot of, of transactions where maybe the seller is represented by an attorney. They'll sign their documents. We get them delivered in escrow, but the transaction is pending a final, a final Alta. So that, that happens a lot. So for the seller, it's more prevalent that they sign under all the security protocols. They send the documents back and we just have everything in escrow waiting for the final numbers. Thank you. That's very helpful information. Thank you. That's a, Those were great questions. Awesome. Anybody else have any comments or questions? Or any, uh, any uh, experience sharing that you guys think would be valuable based on what we spoke about? In the meantime, I'm going to pop up my information on the screen. Um, this is our, this hello address is our kind of general address. This is my email, ricardofoliotata.com. Um, you know, I, I, I mostly live on my WhatsApp on my cell phone. So just feel free to send me a message or call me or an SMS. You know, you guys can follow us. We're posting stuff all the time on, 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 on social media. Um, you know, we've done many closings in the Keys. If we can service you guys anywhere in the state of Florida, we, we'd love to have the opportunity to do so. Awesome. Quick question on your WhatsApp groups, because I was kind of intrigued by that. We use WhatsApp here in the office a lot. And um, who do you, who's typically in, in the group? Is it mostly people within Folio or are you adding lender, adding listing agent, adding all the parties or what does yes. that look like? So we have basically two broad variations with real estate agents. 
that we're developing relationships with or have a relationship with, they have their own, we call it WhatsApp channel. So it's Jacqueline and then your transaction coordinator at Folio and, and the closer that you usually work with and, and usually myself. So I have over 800 WhatsApp groups on my phone. Um, that conversation is pre-contract, post-closing. Hey, I just have a general question. Hey, have you seen this article? And it's kind of a more intimate conversation. If we're in a transaction, there are, there are things you want to ask about that you may not want to ask in front of the client. We give you that kind of private space. That's open to you all the time. Then the other variation is the transactional part, right? In the transactional piece, you know, we have the name of the transaction as a group name, and then we put the property address, we put the key dates, we put everything that is, you know, contextual into the WhatsApp like description. So it's really easy to search. So we have real estate agents that have, you know, three, four, five transactions at a time. So they can just search by property address and they'll show it. And there we put the real estate agent again with the clients. Now, many clients ask us to invite an attorney or their lender or their accountant. So whoever the client wants to invite, we'll throw them in there. But that's really the client's channel. The real estate agent can see what they're asking. The team can see what is being talked about. And it provides a sense of, of transparency and community. So we separate these two to allow the real estate agent to also have their own private space. Nice. I like it. It's a great idea. Yeah. Um, Awesome. Well, I'm going to also share your contact information with, with everybody. Um, this was super helpful. Is there, do you share this slide, the, the slide with me too? And I can put it in my, in my group so they can come yeah. back to it. I will PDF this so that you can share it. Awesome. Um, I I'd love you guys to, to sign up to, to our newsletter. We're, we're coming up with, you know, we only send one once a month, but we usually send like a new training or something that's interesting and I think you guys would find it valuable. So I'll, I'll send you a little link. You just put in your name, your email, and then you can get our newsletter. And, and, I, and I hope I have the opportunity to work with you guys. I really appreciate your time. Awesome. Thank you again so much. I find you uh, very engaging and informative. So super helpful. Thank you so much. I've been doing this over 20 years and I definitely... Oops. Well, th thank you for the opportunity. I'll, I'll... Pearls of wisdom. So, um, yeah. I keep, I keep freezing, but, um, <laughs> but thank you again. And, um, I'll send everything to everybody and you can hop off and have a wonderful day. And everybody else can stay on for a few more minutes. I just want to have a quick chat. Thank um, you. Thank bye you bye. so much. Bye. Let me get out of here. Let me see. Thank you. Oh, here it is. Stop share. There we go. Awesome. Well, thank you all for uh, being here. What did you guys think about Ricardo? I thought he was awesome. That okay. really cleared up a lot of that stuff that you always kind of wonder about. Yeah, right. Um, Very informative. Just, yeah, just really diving into um, all the details. So, um, you know, it sometimes it does pay off to be a nerd. He, I found him super engaging when we met. I was like, I've got to, I've got to have you talk to the office because you just really know what you're doing. He um, seems really robust. Like, and I'm sure there's other title companies down here that are that robust, but I don't, I don't think I've been involved necessarily with any of them that seem as robust as what he kind of offers. I for, agree. For the consumer. Yeah. Yeah, way just a whole nother level of like diving into business and making this a business and how can I help and how can I do things? And no, I, I don't, I haven't ever seen that. So um, so I'd certainly feel comfortable using him. Um, I, I feel confident just in him as, you know, and he's co-founder. So I'm sure his company, I mean, look at the size of his team. So I'm sure they do an excellent job. It really sounds that way. So um, I'll share all of his contact information and those slides once I get them and then a recording of today. Um, actually, yeah, we don't need to record this part. He recorded that. Um, and so um, let me know if you guys um, uh, use him at all and so that we can kind of share with the group on, on your experience there. So 
which um, I'm not going to hold a class on the week of Thanksgiving because uh, I know a lot of people are traveling. So um, so that one is normally our, our class. So I kind of combine them today, but I'm just I just have a few things to ask about. Um, we are considering and I know it's, you know, Christmas and, and end of year and everything is just upon us already. So I wanted to make some decisions on. Um, on an event, um, we normally, as you all know, do a company uh, end of year celebration. Um, but we've in recent years really got more into um, celebrating with our clients and pop buys and Thanksgiving pop buys and all of that. And so I kind of thought about, oh yeah, come on and Sam. <laughs> Um, uh, we were, Sam and I were discussing kind of some options. She was looking into a few things for us. Um, I was thinking about doing instead of depreciation party, um, and maybe combining that, where's all my notes, um, with some other efforts such as to kind of get, um, get some people behind it I thought we could do something a little more fun like um or meaningful um in including it um like a food drive so um one option that I was looking at was a party at Safe Harbor Angler House in Isla Mirada um, which is a giant tiki bar and there's grills and things like that and so what I'm kind of envisioning is a get together for all of us you can invite your clients, um, your database, your sphere of influence, those people that you've been contacting, you know, for a year or two now and asking them to send you business and, you know, just showing your appreciation for them. Um, oh, we lost you. And we have a couple of bars in charge of bringing all of our own food, um, I'm sorry, my internet is a little unstable. I hope you guys can can hear me okay. Um, but we'd be in, in charge of bringing our own food. So envisioning doing a few things and Sam and Chris and um, we can make a really nice spread um, and doing a nice little giveaway, an ornament or some other fun little things. And um, and then, and tell, you know, it's a free event for them, but uh, maybe making it a food drive at the same time so that they can kind of get behind something meaningful too. So um, what are your thoughts on an event like that? Thanks. Could you guys all hear me okay? Because I know my internet again is unstable. I don't know why. I think it's my computer. Not... Or maybe I'm froze again. Am I froze again? I think in theory, it's a good idea. Do you think it's going to be hard to find a date that isn't, I feel like there's so many things like that going on. Do you think it's going to be hard to find a date that's going to work? It it always is every year when we do our, our own. Um, but there are some dates that um, Safe Angler's House is available. And I still need to check them with other calendars. But right now, the options where Angler House is available is uh, December 8th through 12th, which is a Sunday through Thursday. Um, so it looks like a lot of their weekends are already gone. And then December 16th through the 25th. So that's a whole, that's like 10 days. There's So there's still a lot of days that Angler's House is available. Um, so whenever we decide on our company party, I always go and try to look at the chamber of commerce calendars, not everything's posted there. Um, but I do my best and you know, it is what it is. Um, but it would be, you know, just a nice opportunity, I think, to, um, show our appreciation, um, you know, and give them a nice little gift to take away and it's our end of year party and, uh, and all of that. So, it's still something that I like to do anyway. I don't know if I'm frozen again. <laughs> it keeps happening. I'm going to call Norman today again to come back and look at my computer. I don't know. It just keeps happening. Well, I know the um, Founders Park Winterfest is the 7th. Okay. So. Was your staying connected this whole time? 
kind of, but I can't get on it. Like I can't see anything I could hear. Uh -huh. Can you guys hear me? I was trying to hop onto my desk and my laptop, but it wouldn't, wouldn't yes. work. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. My, I keep freezing. I can't tell when, when I'm not, I got to turn my video on. I guess I can tell when I'm frozen or not. Um, so, um, but, um, uh, but anyway, yeah, so it's just kind of a more hyped up version of our, um, company end of year party where we get to invite our clients and thank them for the opportunity. Um, I am looking at the cost for this and I, as a company would be able to cover it for for most of it, um, up to a certain number of people, you know, so obviously we're having 300 people, um, I got to draw the line somewhere. So what I'm thinking, and I'll get costs out to you guys, but, um, you guys would be covered by the company and maybe like your first, you know, five people or something like that. And then anything additional over that you guys could, you know, kick in to cover your additional clients. Um, but it's, it's looking very reasonable. So, um, but again, good way to connect with them and spend some time, you know, face to face with your people and, and we could make it a way to give back to the community too, by, um, you know, making it a food drive or something to that effect. So. I like it. All right. got Ada likes it. <laughs> Does anybody have any dates that they cannot do that we can maybe do that because. Yes, Make it a little the, easier. Yep. Between the 8th, the d dates again, the anglers is available is December 8th through 12th and the 16th through 25th. So good point, Sam. If there's any of those dates that you guys already know um, won't work for you, I'd love to, to hear that. Yeah, because getting everybody to decide on one specific date, I'd rather, I'd rather know which dates you really can't be there. Mm-hmm. We tend to do them in the middle of the week, right? Usually. Um. Yeah, we don't really do um. The weekends typically because the the I just never you know we usually do ours at um. C and C. C and C, and I can't see anything on their calendar on the cheap key Largo chamber. I don't know what's going on with that. Oh, I don't know what that was. Um. um well, because we have like the parade is the 14th. Mm -hmm. Founders Park Christmas is the 7th. Those are dates that. Those are dates we don't want to do. Yeah, yeah, which they're not on there anyway. Um, so, yeah, so. I think that they're pretty safe. Is everybody good with like a Wednesday or Thursday? Can we decide like that? thing on the key largo chamber of commerce um calendar yet like nothing all right i'm not hearing anybody so <laughs> i know looking for a little input here guys yeah. yeah i could use a little input just so i because i would love for everybody to be there so i just want to know well also you know this is for everybody so i'm not going to just yeah. go down there by myself so um yeah exactly i think day should be fine for me any day will be fine for me all right yeah awesome. i know that the weekends get a little crazy so i mean that the weekdays are tend to be right so looking a at a easier. calendar again i guess uh, uh, you know on that week um 16th through the 25th i probably wouldn't be interested in doing like anything past it really be for me probably 16th through 19th because then i think a lot of people are traveling it's cro close to christmas um 16th through 19th is monday through thursday um i do see i think the island Rada chamber after hours is the 17th um i think a Wednesday or a Thursday are probably better days. Um, yeah, we so could do like the 11th or the 18th then. 11th or 12th or 18th to 19th is probably what I'd narrow it down to. Um, so maybe we can check those dates with 
and really we're a little we're a little close already for the 11th to 12th because what i'd like to do is get some nice invitations together too that you guys could give out or hand out or mail out um so we need time to make that happen um so let me see again this calendar uh, bu, 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 bu. so december 18th or 19th 19th is art walk um so maybe december 18th that sounds like a good one to me all right well i know some of you might also be doing other things at the moment it sounds like um so if you could get back to me on your thoughts um i'd appreciate it we'll keep working on a cost so that you'll know um you know what so we can really figure it out um you know if this would uh if this would work for um you know would be and everything for everybody hey and your comments and questions i'm sure i was frozen for part of that uh, <laughs> um, but um thanks again you guys i will let's chat soon all right, bye.